Morning, Jordan. Morning, Skip. You're here bright and early. <laughs> I'll give you both of those. <laughs> and, and, and Nick is here with us too. Good morning, Nick. Oh, excellent. Uh, okay. Hey, Nick. Nick is here on uh, on YouTube. And uh, so, anyway. Okay, so today I'm going to try something a little bit different. Uh, this is uh, Skip's version of opening the vein and bleeding uh, once again. Cool, Skip Hemingway. Huh? Skip Hemingway. Yeah. All right. So um, today I'm going to work with uh, with this book. Um, which is called, um, let's see here, let's see where I can get it. Okay, come on, all right, screw it. I'll turn off the virtual background for a minute. Oh God, uh, this is the bane of my existence. Okay, good morning, Art, nice to see you today. Okay, so today I'm going to work with this book. Uh, Jorge and Ferrer, uh, with a forward by Richard Tarnas, Revisioning Transpersonal Theory, a Participatory Vision in of Human Spirituality. Now, um, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to bring everyone uh, forward 60 years. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to drop you right in the middle of it and hope you can swim <laughs> because that's uh, that's the best I can can do in the short term. Uh, this is quite a profound book and um, it relates back to a couple of things. Uh, one is have to pull out my answer to Job, sorry. All right. So Carl Jung uh, threw a, a stone in the water and it continues to ripple out today. And, <clears throat> and that stone relates to religion because religion relates to psychology and vice versa. And so we need to understand where this comes from. Okay, so first of all, uh, I've read it a few times before, but I'll do it again for those of you who might not have heard it. Um, this quote is actually in Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. And it's in the very first essay of volume one uh, which I have dealt with in this group before. Um, and Dr. Young had emphasized in answer to Job that we need a, a reinterpretation of all the major religions into modern categories of understanding. But what is the essential kernel here is this, this quote. And this quote is from a, rever uh, a letter to Reverend Morton T. Kelsey on 3 May, 1958. And this is what he said. The continuing incarnation of the Holy Spirit in mortal man becomes the signature of a new spirituality in the coming eon. Quote, we are still looking back to the Pentecostal events in a dazed way instead of looking forward to the goal the Spirit is leading us to. Therefore, mankind is wholly unprepared for the things to come. Man is compelled by divine forces 
to go forward to increasing consciousness and cognition, developing further and further away from his religious background because he does not understand it anymore. His religious teachers and leaders are still hypnotized by the beginnings of a then new eon of consciousness instead of understanding them and their implications. What one once called the Holy Ghost is an impelling force, creating wider consciousness and responsibility and thus enriched cognition. The real history of the world seems to be the progressive incarnation of the deity. Now, obviously that introduces huge conflicts uh, in humanity because the deity has been incarnating in many different ways. And I just want to point back to the last paragraph of Answer to Job. I'm looking at C.G. Young's Answer to Job, where he says, um, He says, therefore, the question as to whether the process is initiated by consciousness or by the archetype can never be answered unless in contradiction to experience one either robbed the archetype of its autonomy or degraded consciousness to a mere machine. We find ourselves in best agreement with the psychological experience if we concede to the archetype a definite measure of independence and to consciousness a degree of creative freedom proportionate to its scope. There then arises that reciprocal action between two relatively autonomous factors, which compels us when describing and explaining the processes to present sometimes one and sometimes the other factor as the acting subject, even when God becomes man. That's an important phrase, even when God becomes man. The Christian solution has hitherto avoided this difficulty by recognizing Christ as the one and only God-man, but the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the third divine person in man, brings about a Christification of many, and the question then arises whether these many are all complete God-men. Such a transformation would lead to insufferable collisions between them, to say nothing of the unavoidable inflation to which the ordinary mortal who is not freed from original sin would instantly succumb. In these circumstances, it is well to remind ourselves of St. Paul and his split consciousness. On one side, he felt he was the apostle directly called and enlightened by God. And on the other side, a sinful man who could not pluck out the thorn in the flesh and rid himself of the satanic angel who plagued him. That is, that is to say, the enlightened person remains what he is and is never more than his own limited ego before the one who dwells within him, whose form has no knowable boundaries who encompasses him on all sides, fathomless as the abysms of the earth and vast as the sky. Okay, so that was Dr. Young at the end of his life, um, sort of throwing down the gauntlet. Okay, so shortly after that, uh, various thinkers on the West Coast uh, started to talk about transpersonal theory and what that meant. And one of the things it was talking about was um, personal religious experiences. And I often speak of, uh, of several that I've had, but one in particular, uh, because I happened to photograph it. And when I photographed it, you will see what I mean. And so some of the people here may not have heard this story. Uh, let, me ex let me describe it to you. So I was in a very uh, depressed state at one point. 
I had been uh, fighting the powers that be in the United States uh, for, at that point, about six years. And I had uh, just lost in one of my five appeals to the Court of Appeals of Maryland. And um, so after so much time in fighting a lawsuit single-handedly and uh, writing a brief that was probably a hundred pages long and then having it dismissed out of hand, uh, you know, you can, you can get banged in your head just so many times. Um, and one of these times I actually uh, took their decision to the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, where I was also bashed. Uh, and uh, that's a whole different story. Uh, I was right, but uh, they couldn't countenance my rightness because if they did so, uh, it would cause, uh, it could conceivably cause uh, Wall Street to have very serious problems. And uh, I readily acknowledge that. Um, but in any case, whatever, uh, I was pretty upset because I had lost and I had made a good case and, and I wasn't allowed to actually make it to the Court of Appeals. They simply dismissed my appeal. So um, in terms of what's going on right now, <laughs> I, I could well put myself in the position of Donald Trump in terms of getting smashed back by the courts uh, because that's what happened to me in my lawsuit. Uh, but that's not the issue today. So I was depressed and uh, sometimes when I'm depressed and when we're not in COVID, I haven't been able to do this since March, but uh, before that time, um, I was able to go on to the grounds of the US Naval Academy and go to the chapel there and uh, just meditate okay, or pray or what, what have you. Um, I'm not very much into the traditional ways of going about these things. So I simply would go to the chapel because I find the, the environment there comforting and I would just sit and, and meditate. And so at that chapel, there are, uh, benches, the chapel is called the Cathedral of the Navy, and it's set up in that way uh, as a traditional cathedral in the shape of a cross. So there's the main section going forward and back, but to the left and right, there's an arm like a cross. And so at the front of the chapel in the rotunda, uh, there are some pews that face either to the left or to the right. And on the left wall of the chapel, uh, there is a beautiful stained glass window. And that stained glass window was done by Tiffany and it is therefore priceless in its value. And you'll see it in a moment. Um, but I like that stained glass window very much. And so I typically would sit on the right side of the chapel in the pews that face this stained glass window uh, during my meditation sessions. And on this particular day, um, I was in the chapel, it was maybe 1030 or 1030 or so in the morning. Uh, and it was quite dark, there was no unnatural lighting in the chapel. And I was basically sitting there in the dark and suddenly I was lit up, okay? Literally light was shining on me. And I looked up and this is what I saw. Okay, so here's the stained glass window as I described it. The part on the top here uh, is the Tiffany window, these, these three stained glass windows. These below are not Tiffany and you can see just a qualitative difference in their, um, in their quality as stained glass windows. 
and you can see that Tiffany had a much more subtle style. But I'm sitting there in the dark, and you can see how dark the chapel was at this point in time. And I looked up, and I saw this light, and it was shining only on me. And I said, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. And then I said, nobody's ever going to believe this. And my attitude changed instantly from being very depressed to being almost euphoric. And I said to myself, nobody's ever going to believe this unless I take a picture of it. So I took my cell phone out and I shot this picture. And then I turned it around on myself and I took this selfie. And once again, you can see uh, on this picture how bright it was lighting up my face. And this was probably 20 to 30 seconds after the whole experience began. And because the, the sun moves so quickly, uh, it was much more flooding me before I took this picture, but I still caught it on my face. But behind me again, you can see how dark it was. And these two things are actually also stained glass windows. So you can see how dark it was outside that day. And this, this one, which some people have said, oh my God, that must be a gargoyle or something. Actually, that's the great seal of the United States Naval Academy. And so, um, so I had this experience. It was a spiritual experience. And, um, and so the point is that uh, these sorts of things happen to many of us uh, all the time. They, they happen to me almost daily, as a matter of fact. And, uh, um, but in, not in quite as strong strength and not in a context where I can just show you a photograph of it, but they do happen to me regularly. And so all of the great religions are somehow um, have their beginning in a religious experience like that. And I can um, attest to the fact that these are very, um, very powerful religion or very powerful experiences. But um, the issue is that maybe you can't put a specific um, meaning around it. Obviously, if, if you had been sitting there in the chapel, you wouldn't have had the same experience because you wouldn't be um, you wouldn't be depressed like I was on that occasion, and you would just see the light going across my face and then going on through the rest of the chapel, something it does every day at that hour or close to that hour. And so in terms of it being a meaningful religious experience, it was only a religious experience to me, and I acknowledge that. But it was extremely powerful, and it really changed uh, my outlook on everything I was doing at that time. And, uh, and so that's a long way to describe the beginning of the, trans, the so-called transpersonal movement, okay, which started in the early 1960s, shortly after Dr. Jung wrote those two pieces that I read at the beginning of this uh, session. And in the 1960s in California, uh, these often emerged in terms of um, LSD trips or other, uh, other pharmaceutical enhanced <laughs> trips. And people are still doing that and people are still begging me to give them sanction to go ahead and and use drugs to get these experiences and uh, i won't do that and i don't do that because uh, first of all uh, if you haven't earned your experience 
you uh, it's not a real experience for you and it's not going to be meaningful to you and um I mean, it may be meaningful to you to the extent that you want to go back and have have another trip on the drugs, but unfortunately, that leads to sixty or seventy thousand Americans dying every year of drug overdose. And in my personal relationships, friends and family, uh, we've lost three people, actually four now. Um, because of drug overdoses in the last three years. And so this is obviously a scourge in the United States. It's um, second only to the COVID scourge and uh, it's a major cause of death. And so we're not going to go there because I don't think that that's necessary. And neither do the people who were involved in this book that I'm looking at. So I'm looking at revisioning transpersonal theory uh, by Jorge and Ferre Ferreira, and uh, with a introduction by Richard Tarnas, or forward by Richard Tarnas. Now um, I just want to. I'm just going to drop you in the middle of it, um, and. Uh, let you sink or swim because I think you have to read this book, but you have to you have to understand some things about transpersonal theory. And um, so I strongly urge you to go back before you even do that and listen to what Becca Tarnas said to us uh, on uh, August the 30th. And I'll put a link to her talk uh, in the um, in the replay of this video, so that you'll be able to find it, and then once you find it, I urge you to listen to that um, probably five to ten times. I know I've listened to it about ten times personally, and it, it takes a while to follow uh, what she's saying because. Um, a lot of it flies in the face of traditional religion. And uh, you have to sort of suspend everything that you think you know about religion and spirituality and just listen to what she has to say. And, uh, and once you grok it, then you can probably understand this book. Um, and my criticism of this group, there, this is, uh, one, Dr. Ferreira is one of the um, professors at the California Institute of Integral Studies, a name that I can barely remember. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not just convenient like uh, Harvard or Stanford, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and it's called CIIS, and that reminds me of CIS, and <clears throat> that's uh, what my father used to say. If somebody wanted to send you bad news, um, they would send you a CIS letter, which means, uh, which stands for Christ, I'm sorry. <laughs> so if you get turned down for admission to Harvard, that's a CIS letter. But anyway, so that goes way back but um but the point is um well there's no point i guess yeah. well skip anyway, before you before you yeah, go, go into ahead. the reading all right i was going to address your two points one your experience but second the, the use of drugs to get there um there's a concept of there are no rootless flowers and going with an lsd or other type of trip is plucking the flower off the top but you don't get the whole garden of you and it's temporary and the flowers dying as soon as it comes off. So you will hit the high, but there's no context of how to utilize it. And the other example for that to me is the runner's high at 22 miles. You don't get it sitting on the couch and you get it from the work and you know, you can schedule inspiration. You don't know when it's going to come, but you put it on your schedule and you work. And during that time, for example, back to then your chapel experience um, 
architecturally, the purpose of stained glass is not to represent, to actually enact and be the voice of God and light. And it's usually a metaphor and it's usually subtle, but then occasionally you get those intense times like you had where the shine becomes so specific. It's as if it's filling your cup with light. And that is no flower without roots. That's a flower with roots because you're there in the experience and you have the wholeness without drugs. And the drugs are what happened in your own brain. Right. And all, all this goes back to, um, to Friedrich Nietzsche's observation that God is dead. And so let's talk about that for a moment. So up until around 1500, uh, human beings pretty much were accepting the guidance of their religious leaders and the religious leaders were doing the best they can, but they made a number of assertions. <clears throat> and beginning with uh, Copernicus and Galileo and some others, um, people started to find out some things about the universe that made what the church had been saying uh, for 1500 years and actually going back to time immemorial um, incorrect okay I mean those had been those ideas had been developed by early Iron Age men who had no scientific in instruments so they were simply trying to explain their world um, quite reasonably they were trying to do that um, but science scientists beginning around, you know, 1480 uh, started to dispute what the church was saying. And Galileo was even run up before the Inquisition and uh, had to swear on a Bible uh, that the earth doesn't um, orbit the sun, that the sun orbits the earth. <clears throat> and he, he did that, um, I'm sure tongue in cheek, <clears throat> because he knew that um, the church kept good records and he was making monkeys of them for all time. And uh, so that's uh, his statement is called uh, the abjuration of Galileo Galilee, uh, Galilei, Galileo Galilei. Okay, the abjuration of Galileo Galilei. So look that up one. Um, on the uh, Wikipedia and you can read it. It's only a couple of paragraphs long and it's, it's a total hoot. <laughs> he could speak in code really well. He actually right. made it really I mean, it's, it's not even a cipher. If you have any academic background, all you know is this is someone who's the proper method of tact is being able to tell someone to go to hell in such a way that they thoroughly look forward to the journey. Right. Okay. So over the next 500 years, um, science put, put holes in basically all Western religious doctrine. And, um, and so nowadays we, um, if you go to church, most of the time you're going to find pastors who are uh, just speaking the party line and um, and they'll use all the what Thomas Aquinas said 1500 years ago as their authority um, and the problem is that we're going forward we're not going backward and you know Thomas Aquinas's experience were was quite significant at the time obviously and it still sticks with us it has an overhang, but <clears throat> but we're going forward. We're not going backward. And so we have to uh, think about it. And, you know, a lot of people know this. And so what happened with Friedrich, Friedrich Nietzsche is he simply stated the ob what was obvious to people already uh, throughout Western Europe. Uh, and that was that you know when you go to church you're hearing all these wonderful things but 
none of them are necessarily true in the physical world. However, the reason they've hung on is because they are true <clears throat> as narratives in the psychic world. And so they have allowed people to maintain their mental health and their balance over uh, millennia. And so therefore, none of them are necessarily bad per se, but what's bad is when churches or religions uh, insist it's my way or the highway, and then they de decide to go, up, go to war with people who uh, think slightly differently. Uh, and, you know, I'm here exactly for that reason, because my first ancestors uh, came here to get, a, get out of the 80 years war uh, with Spain, where the Spanish were coming up to Holland every summer to beat the Dutch back into the Catholic Church. And the Dutch would flood their country every fall and the Spanish would go home to sunny Spain for the winter. And so that went on for 80 years. And uh, that's where the idea of the hard-headed Dutchman comes from <laughs> because the Dutchmen weren't gonna change. Um, but in any case, uh, we, well, we've, go ahead. I was to say, speaking um, about Nietzsche's statement, if God is dead, um, on page 62, it just really reminded me of uh, one of the middle portions of the Mercurius quadratus, which is the mercurial splitting into four. But if I may just read this one paragraph from Answer to Job, um, it speaks what, to... What is the paragraph? Uh, paragraph 675. All right. This quaternity has a distinctly pneumatic nature and is therefore expressed by angels who are generally pictured with wings, i.e. as aerial beings. This is more likely as they are presumably the descendants of Ezekiel's four seraphim, the doubling and separation of the quaternity into an upper and a lower one, like the exclusion of the Satans, notice the plural, from the heavenly court points to a metaphysical split that had already taken place. But the pleromatic split is in turn a symptom of a much deeper split of the divine will. The father wants to become the son. God wants to become man. The amoral wants to become exclusively good. The unconscious wants to become consciously responsible. And here's the part that really applies. So far, everything exists only in statu nascendi. And that's the state of sleep okay. uh, the nascent and that's god is dead meaning he's gone to sleep and is now within us because the church was just that flower without roots okay i, do, I don't want to get that deeply into answer to joe and the reason is that um that's while well, that's a very meaningful paragraph to you and me uh it is also um practically incomprehensible if you're not familiar with the answer to Joe. And so what I'm well, trying yeah, to- Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's more jargonistic. I mean, so right. in terms of it's down deep in, the, in our right. professional weeds. So what I'm trying to do here is to make some ideas um, very easy to understand for laymen who are not up to their neck in, um, in metaphysical ideas and so on. Uh, good morning to everyone. So, and so I think that idea of just the status not endy, which is the state of sleep, uh, is important in terms of the waking of the consciousness. Right. To be okay. put so it in we, layman's terms. So we are waking the consciousness. So, so my point about Dr. Jung is simply this: Friedrich Nietzsche said that God is dead, and we have killed him. Now, what he meant by that was that the that the myths of the church were no longer believable by the end of the 19th century. And Jung came along in the 20th century, one generation later, found the living God, where he lives, and how he goes about doing the work of the Godhead. Now, that's 
that's my observation. But nonetheless, that's what the 20 volumes of Dr. Jung's collected works really refers to. And particularly the last four major works. And I'm not asking you to understand <coughs> the complexity of Jungian psychology today. I'm trying to get to the next step, which is transpersonal ideas. And, um, and we've been doing Jungian psychology for the last four and a half years. And so there's 1100 videos behind me that <laughs> will bring you up, up to that speed. But if I might uh, also add a little historical correspondence to that from a couple of thousand years earlier, um, the Eastern statement of if you see Buddha on the road, kill him. And the meaning of that is, is if, if you see God outside yourself, you're delusioned, you're delusional. And it's a matter of seeing yourself and the sacred nature around you and within you. So the see, if you see Buddha on the road, kill him, is saying it's almost the same thing as Nietzsche said. Okay, but I don't want to be saying that either. Okay, because um, because the idea that you would kill anyone um, is not what this is about. And but it's not indicating murder. It's indicating if that's your seeing yourself. Uh, Jordan, I'm sorry. When you use that language, people think you mean it. Okay, and and so so please. I won't historically quote accurately. If you see the Buddha on the road, you are seeing yourself, and that is an illusion. <laughs> to transpose okay, it accurately, Jordan, but all right, I'm sorry, we digress here. Please let me go on. Okay, uh, Manuela says also American discovery made a huge impact. Native American people were perceived as living in sin and being primitive, but they seemed to be living in paradise without church and surrounded by beautiful natural scenery. I, I agree entirely. Um, so different people come at different situations in different ways and they uh, use guns, germs, and steel to, uh, to create it their way. And the, the truth is that, um, and Manuelas rightfully says that uh, the Native Americans at the time that Europeans came were living in a basic, basically in a paradise. And, but they were living in sort of an, a more primitive state than had developed in Europe. And so when the two sides finally collided, and mind you, all, all the Native Americans originally came through from Asia um, and through the, the Bering Land Bridge, the original ones, and, and people differ about how long ago that was, but it was between 13,000 and 35,000 years ago, uh, because we can find no human, nothing human before 35,000 years ago at all in the, in the Americas. And so all of us, even Native Americans, came from someplace else. And, um, and we all developed as human beings at different speeds. And, but now civilization around the world is converging, um, if not on one spot, at least in a general area through the internet. Okay, so now I wanna go to uh, a couple of things that Richard Tarnas referred to in his forward to this book. Um, he says, the great underlying drama of the modern Western self, as it strove to emerge from its historic religious matrix, that is to define itself autonomously, and thus in some sense to disengage itself from Christianity and the dominant vessel of the Western spiritual impulse for a better part of two millennia, the leading figures in transpersonal psychology were all working within and reacting against a Western cultural tradition whose religious imagination had been deeply informed and problematically dominated by Christianity. The reasons for this tension uh, were many and complex 
but an antig antagonistic response, sometimes subtle, other times explicit to the Judeo-Christian legacy in the West was generally shared by the entire transpersonal community and the larger counterculture of which it was part. And this in turn influenced and encouraged its immense attractions to the spiritual riches of the East. But beyond the explicitly spiritual and religious dimension of this attitude, all the leaders of the transpersonal movement shared the larger background of the Enlightenment's historical struggle with the Christian religion for dominance in the modern worldview. Okay, so the Enlightenment was actually um, in in one way in, in the um, in the kind of religious way it was actually another religion that was struggling for dominance, namely the scientific method. And so I jokingly refer to it as the endarkenment. Um, let me uh, going to let one other person here. Uh, the endarkenment is a really good way to put it because you, it, it fractured off and tried to blind spot a whole piece rather than making it more inclusive of the whole. Right. Okay. So, so anyway, that, I mean, this is sort of human nature, right? It's uh, you want to believe that you have all the answers and, uh, and we just can't have, there's too many answers. And so, uh, and welcome to David Gee for, uh, Gee for joining us. I'm sorry, David, I don't recall how to properly pronounce your name, but it's you G, any... G. G? G, G with a double E, like the Bee Gees. Yeah, G, like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a hard G, okay, like the Bee Gees. Welcome anyway, thank you. Thanks for stopping by. Okay, um, so what I'm trying to get to here is just, and I don't know why these people called it transpersonal psychology. Um, and um, so, so it anyway. would seem that it was seen that transpersonal is the inclusive of the collective unconscious. It's like they're trying to move forward. Right. Okay. So they're, so they're trying to um, have the enlightenment, but inclusive of spirituality. That's basically what I understand. And, um, and so one of the issues that's going on in this book is uh, an issue about what's called the perennial philosophy. And what that means is that um, there is one truth, okay? and that it is identifiable. Well, maybe not. <laughs> and so, um, and so uh, let me read this little bit here. Enlightenment had privileged with respect to the physical world, a pre-given impersonal universal truth that was independent of all subjective and cultural uh, interpretations, and that could be empirically verified with appropriate methodologies uh, employed by an appropriate community of investigators. This perennialist truth uh, was the highest truth, superior to all others. It was a truth exclusively capable of including and defining all other truths. Okay, so this is what, um, this is what they were originally talking about in this transpersonal movement that um, that all basically the idea that all religions are the same and they're and they all uh, approach thing they call things differently but if you add up the main tenets of each of the major religions you'll find more or less the same thing and um, and that's not true. And it's, uh, and, you know, the problem is that uh, we have some ecumenicism in uh, the among theologians. In other words, uh, our local community of 
uh, pastors, priests, mullahs, etc. We'll get together once a month and they'll have a nice lunch and they'll chit chat about the way of the world. But then they all go back to their own um, their own ideas and don't really pay attention to the others. And what is really being talked about here is uh, to get beyond that level. And of course, they're not doing it with their congregations. In other words, um, I see no evidence of uh, the Presbyterian church getting, getting together with a, uh, a congregation from the local Jewish temple or anything like that. Uh, and I don't see examples of the, of the Catholics getting together with the Presbyterians either, except on very rare occasions. Um, Skip, I would say that in terms of that one truth, a good, decent example to rephrase it would be all architecture has structure, but it's not all the same. And it's not just stylistic differences. You're, you're canceling out the culture. You're canceling out the genesis and form givers and the subtleties which actually color and texture that particular religion. Now, structurally, they may have the same conceptual components, but they're rarely enacted in identical ways that you could make, make synonymous. Okay, so um, one of the points that Becca brought up in her comment of, uh, or in her talk of August 30th, was, and this is coming down to individuals now, that was the idea of enactment, okay? And so one of the fundamental ideas in this book is that uh, instead of living a pre-given um, form, okay, where it's my way or the highway, which has resulted in, in the case of Protestantism, at least 400 different sects, because each one doesn't quite agree with the others. Um, and, um, and obviously when you have th those kinds of dis disagreements, sometimes you fight over them. And that's been sort of the history of humanity up until now. But, um, but the point is that the spirit, and this is the quote that I read at the beginning of this session, is that the spirit is taking us somewhere and it's taking all of us. It's not, it's not taking just the Catholics or just the Protestants, just the Jews, just the Hindus, just the um, Buddhists. It's taking every human being someplace and, um, you know, this is where uh, Dr. Jung comes in and he talks about God being the unconscious and that um, we have a personal unconscious. We call that the God image, what we think of as God when we're thinking about God. Each one of us has a different idea of what that is, perhaps, and the other being the collective unconscious, which is the uh, unconscious of all of humanity. Uh, and it's the unconscious of every Frenchman or every American. Um, so even though in the case of America, we have uh, people from every national origin, every race and creed, and yet we're all American. And how can that be? Well, we have certain attributes that are the same that are like no other country. And even though we don't necessarily look the same or we don't necessarily speak the same language sometimes, especially between Spanish and English, for example, um, Americans are quite different, become quite different from everybody else. So when we have immigrants in the US, Typically, they're asked to live here for five years at least uh, before they can become a naturalized American. And part of that is, has to do with a, um, with an infusion of what the American spirit is. And so notwithstanding all of 
uh, the rhetoric that's gone on during our election period lately and the idea that we have these um, lost boys running around in woods shooting semi-automatic weapons for for to get their jollies the reality is it works quite well and we uh, if you go into the grocery store or the drug store or a movie theater we all live together peacefully and uh, we don't really think about the religion or the other we don't really think about the attitudes of the other and uh, in the u.s military for example it's actually prohibited to talk about politics because we know how volatile um, talking about politics can be but when you're in the u.s military you are an american military individual you're not uh, you're not there to be political and so it's actually a crime in the under the uniform code of military justice to talk about politics and this is what general stanley mccrystal ran ran up against uh when he was had a leadership position in afghanistan and he started to make political comments and uh, barack obama brought him back to the white house and and he resigned and he resigned properly because uh he, he's not permitted to have that kind of a discussion as a general officer. Um, and, uh, and so it was quite pro proper under uh, any theory of what the American military do, does to, uh, uh, to have him resign. He, he just wasn't uh, appropriate in the U.S. military any longer once he started to do that. Okay, now, Jordan, you've made a comment here. I, tell us I made it to you just for a reference. Uh, it was directly. Uh, okay. So not for a digression here. All right. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> and uh, David, feel free to speak up, although I'm trying, I, I have an agenda here, so I'm trying to get through some things. Yeah. Thanks. I would like to just to jump in, you know, because what, what you were saying about, you know, waiting five years or <clears throat> before becoming an American citizen. Interesting, the, the, the Portuguese, the 15th century, maybe even, yeah, for the 15th century Portuguese made it mandatory for slaves uh, uh, um, to actually uh, uh, be baptized on the ships uh, uh, before touching shore. And there was re there re really is, the, I mean, the, the, the notion of contamination you know, which is, I'm not making it sound, you know, pejorative, but the, the, for people to accept <clears throat> new people, there must definitely be some kind of change deep down. Well, quite right. And, and you know, actually the, the most devout Christians in the United States, in my opinion, are the AME churches, <laughs> uh, which are typically black churches today. And, and, uh, you know, many of our beloved um, hymns in Christianity actually came from the black community uh, who, who took on Christianity and, and enacted it. And so, but what the fundamental idea is that Becca got at and which this, this transpersonal psychology is addressing is the idea that there's nothing pre-given, okay? There's no uh, God being up in heaven that pre-wrote what the rules are and therefore human beings must, fi must uh, find those rules and, uh, and follow them. Rather, the point is that we have to turn that on its head and understand that we are the only living creatures that have consciousness of where we stand in the universe. You can't ask your dog or your cat about Saturn, okay? <laughs> and, and, uh, and you can't ask a giraffe or a gnat where it stands in the universe, but human beings uh, do have a concept of that, and we have a concept of the spirit, which has been long around. Uh, it was talked about in Star Wars by George Lucas, 
going back uh, almost 50 years now, which he referred to as the force. The force is with you. May the force be with you. Okay, that force is the spirit pushing through to where we're going to be. Okay. Go ahead, Jordan. I was to say, before you move on, I like to speak to David's comment because that was very apt, uh, especially with the Portuguese, uh, before you set foot on their soil, in that it was an inducing of the sanctity to bathe someone in the baptism so at least they have a fresh start before they set foot. And then after that, it's their responsibility to then, et cetera, et cetera. But that was a wonderful ritual that they enacted to assure the sanctity at least was present as a possibility for everyone that came. Right. Okay. I mean, that was the old idea. And so now we're going toward a new idea, which it is, it, which is for all of us, all human beings, it is our responsibility to enact the world that we want. And um, we are informed uh, by God, but what is that God? Well, if, if anybody knew that uh, definitively, um, then we'd probably have to, <laughs> No, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> well, I, I, it begs we don't the question. Know definitively, we don't know definitively what what God is. Doctor Jung referred to it as as the unconscious. But go ahead, George. I was going to say you're, it, it begs the question too. I'm curious. Does this do the same thing but different? In that now there's a self baptism, or is there something new? that you're driving towards that starts this process that's new. It, it, it feels like that everything, and know thyself, you know, above the oracle. Um, mm -hmm. And you can look at even the way the planets move, and it's a DNA strand if you track it moving through a solar system. And so know thyself, everything is within. So I'm curious about the, and I, I get, and I'm, behind you I, just, I think to express or elucidate it a little more the what's new and where are we driving because it feels to be just self-originated which I buy uh, very much uh, what is from your just your perspective what Skip would be uh, the primary difference um, okay, of this we, new we, way all right we're, we're getting to that I mean that's what this whole book is about uh, that we're referring to here so let me read a little bit more from harnesses forward. He says, in a sense, the pioneers and leading theorists of transpersonal psychology had two aims. They wished to legitimate their new discipline and the ontological status of spirituality in the ideas of empirical science, uh, the dominant force of the modern worldview, yet they equally sought to legitimate spirituality and their discipline in their own eyes, which required them to satisfy those standards and assumptions of empirical science that they themselves had internalized in the course of their own intellectual development. So basically, um, these people in the 60s, let's say, were having spiritual experiences, as I've described at the beginning of this um, session, whether they were individually generated or through um, pharmaceuticals gem generated. And so they knew they had had those experiences and they're trying to uh, find empirical answers for why those events happen, because those spiritual events, which we have talked about ad infinitum for the last four and a half years, um, do happen. And uh, they are the, at the foundations of all the major religions. And, and so they were trying to explain those things and they were trying to explain themselves <laughs> them to themselves. Okay, so this is what Tarnas is saying. And, um, and so let me just 
get to, I guess, one other thing that he said. Um, okay, so um, what what he his let's see. Okay, so here's one of the things he says with the crucial insight into the participatory inactive and the pluralistic nature of spiritual truth, the transpersonal field free, uh, frees itself to enter into a new world of openness to the mystery of being that is its ground, accompanied by a newly respectful and fruitful dialogue between diverse religions, metaphysical perspectives, and spiritual practices. Um, and by cutting the Gordian knot that is invisibly bound transpersonal theory to the enlightenment, uh, like an outlived umbilical cord, the transpersonal field can open to new horizons, its vision no longer uh, so riven by futile and too often intolerant undialogical debate. Uh, so I would just, um, if you, if you want to have a giggle, <laughs> uh, then uh, look up uh, Jorge and Ferrer. I'll put it in the YouTube um, uh, you, YouTube chat. Uh, look up this name on Wikipedia, and I'll put it on the Zoom chat as well. And um, what you will find there is a very interesting discussion where um, Richard Tarnas and Jorge Ferrer were very seriously criticized uh, by others in the transpersonal community. Uh, and there, were, there has been this raging debate going on in, uh, in academia uh, about what the truth is. And, and so one of the, uh, one of the final perceptions uh, here and, and what Ferrer does in the beginning of this book is he deconstructs transpersonal theory. And I'll explain what that means in a minute, but he's basically taking the whole movement since 1960 and he backs it down uh, to, its, to its core and then suggests a, a, a different way of thinking about it. And, um, and so one of the things that young people often come, uh, are wondering about when we are having these sessions and in previous sessions that I've had is, you know, they're looking for the truth. What is the truth? I want to know what the truth is. And, um, and the, the idea is that there is a, a written truth, you know, in, in Islam, they say it is written. Okay. In other words, there is a truth and it can be found. And, uh, I'll give you, um, one little glimpse of the future here, which is, uh, Ferrara saying, um, what, uh, what, uh, what can the truth be? What can the truth be or what it ought to be? Um, and so let's see if I can find, okay. So, um, I think it's worth clarifying too that, and I won't go into a digression deep into this, but to clarify what is true versus truth, because as Nietzsche so aptly said that uh, truth is always ever unchanged, um, but that which wins out is simply a function of power rather than of truth. Okay, and and so um, so it's a different perspective. It's. Uh, instead of saying there is a truth which we can uncover or my way or the highway or something like that, um, uh, we can see truth as it ought to be. And that is, you know, that's the secret sauce of America, actually, okay, which is 
people have been attracted to this country for 400 years from around the world. Okay. Um, and perhaps before I, I'll give the um, Native Americans the benefit of the doubt here, but in terms of the European uh, immigration into the United States and so on, um, everybody was looking for truth and we've been clashing and so on uh, ever since, sometimes violently, but most mostly peacefully. And uh, we've found that we can live together by banging together. And so most of the time uh, we do this through debate. And uh, this is what other countries very often don't understand about Americans. They say, how can you be fighting all the time? But that's the secret sauce. That's how we uh, find the way things ought to be, okay? Not the way things are now or, um, you know, are as they are presented by any specific religion, but how they ought to be for uh, the human species. And so we, ha we are always in the process of finding that. Obviously, we have new generations coming all along and they have to be taught to, uh, to debate and so on. But the reality is that we do find answers and the answers uh, emerge um, from this, this constant debate that we have going. And so uh, toward the end of this book, I'll just, uh, Let's see, where is it here? I think it's worth mentioning as an impetus within your point of as coming over here looking for truth, especially you mentioned the ontological bent. And for anyone out there, ontology is simply the study of being, but they are or the relationship of being within a system. And so they are leaving their European ontology going outside like a hermit would leave the collective to find a truth without the chatter of what they're expected to find or what the, the expectations they have grained in. So in a sense, simply put, they get on the boats and they come over here to inspect their expectations and in so shed them to find a new truth or a new okay, so, what it should be kind of truth. Right, so I'm, I'm gonna just read a part of a paragraph here that, um, that Ferrar has, and this is on page uh, whatever. Uh, 177 of this book, uh, he says, but since there are many possible enactions of truer and more liberated self and world, it may be more accurate to talk about them, not so much in terms of things as they really are, but of things as they really can be, or even things that, as they really should be. While the expression of things as they can be would remain more neutral, the expression of things as they really should be would stress the all important ethical dimension of the contemplative endeavor, for example, in terms of moral criticism of egocentric understandings of reality and associated ways of life. And so I have a a few examples uh, that I want to tell you about so that you can uh, appreciate it. Um, my mother uh, used to tell, she was a great storyteller. She was a great narr narrator. And when I was growing up, um, every night um, before we went to sleep, she would come into our bedroom, uh, my brothers and mine, and she would tell us a story. And, um, you know, many times, and I, I really loved those stories for two, three years. She, she did this every night. And I often regret that we don't have recordings of the stories that she told because they were just awesome. Um, but, um, but later on in life, she was often criticized because people would say, oh, mom, that's not true. And her answer was simply this. Well, if it's not true, it ought to be. <laughs> that's the way things ought to be. 
And, uh, and she was right about that. Okay, she was absolutely right about that. Um, and then uh, another example is uh, Mohandas Gandhi, who, um, when he was challenged by authorities, said, you can have my broken body, but you cannot have uh, how I think things ought to be. Okay, and so in other words, he knew what he wanted to see as a result. And ultimately he was at, actually able to convey that um, to the entire population of India and in a, effectively uh, led the independence of, of the UK, of India from the UK. And, uh, and that was simply him saying, this is the way it ought to be. You shouldn't be here, British. And the funny thing is there's a, uh, I think this is in the autobiography or in the biography of Winston Churchill, but uh, in that biography, there's a story told about um, British anthropologists who went to India in 1953. Now, this is six years after um, the British Raj of 250 years had ended. So it was six years after the Raj had ended. And these anthropologists went around India with one question, which was what percentage of the Indian population knew that the British Raj of 250 years was over? You know, what, what percent knew that the Raj was over? And what they found was that 99% of all Indians didn't know it ever began. <laughs> Never mind that it was over. <laughs> and and so um, Gandhi knew that India had to be independent from uh, the UK and that the world ought to be this way, that India would have its independence and would decide its future among Indians. And he manifested that by the, by the independence of India in the same way that, you know, American colonists manifested their independence from um, England in the 18th century. And again, no, Skip, that's actually common culturally, because, for example, uh, 1986, 87, uh, 1991 in Iraq, prior to all of the hubbub that the U.S. created over there, um, the beautiful Iraqi culture would be living their lives and plenty of billboards of Saddam Hussein and the joke would, well, he's so photogenic, why not? But the, when asked, what do you think about X, Y, or Z, there often would simply be the response, oh, that's, that's for them. We need to live our lives. We just know when number two crosses them because they die in a helicopter. So, I mean, it's the kind of thing where they had a general knowledge, but they, they lived their lives like those 99% of the Indians in India that had no idea about the Raj. And from their personal perspective daily, it had affected their enactment in ways that were most likely neg negligible or that were absorbed. Okay. Um, right. Um, so, um, I'll just uh, read a, a segment here that he particularly um, particularly emphasizes, and uh, I'll be coming back to it later. But um, he says, if reality is not merely discovered, but enacted through co-creative participation, and if what we bring to our inquiries affects in important ways the disclosure of reality, then the fundamental interrelationship and even identity between phenomenology and ontology 
between knowledge and liberation in the spiritual search steps in the spiritual search stops being a conundrum and becomes a natural necessity. And if this is the case, there is no conflict whatsoever from the participatory vision to simultaneously maintain that there exists a plurality of spiritual ultimates and that all of them may disclose things as they really are. Okay, so the point, his point here is that, um, you know, within perennialism, I guess, the idea that all religions are fundamentally the same, that there are some differences and they may disclose different things that others hadn't thought about. And I think that that's fairly true. Now, another example of this things as they uh, really can be or really should be. Uh, another example is um, Tim Holmes's statue, re, uh, Returning the Nails. I'm sorry, I didn't get it up on my, on my uh, desktop yet. So let me grab that um, so that you can see uh, Tim's sculpture, sculpture, which I found to be quite, um, uh, quite mind boggling, but, but it's nonetheless uh, a very powerful uh, thing. Where is it? So actually the whole time we're really driving to that uh, participatory vision of human spirituality going beyond absolutism, not ion, into not relativism, phenomenology of self, not the ontology, the larger, and not the phenomenology of the everyday smaller. Um, altogether is seemingly, I think that's your overarching topic today in a way, correct? Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't carefully uh, following you, Jordan. So say it again. Uh, the participatory, participatory vision of human spirituality uh, beyond absolutism and relativism, I think we had on the email as the topic for today, there, where the ontology or the ontological is the absolutism, the, the, the system as it were, that is purported to be stable and singular, whereas the relativism would also be the phenomenological or phenomenology of our day-to-day -day and the personal rather than to intra or interpersonal or transpersonal as it would be. So it's small and large, it seems like is the big concept here between context and individuality, but putting them together in a new direction, it seems is what you're going at. Well, um, yes, that's sort of it, Jordan, but I have to tell you that I have a hard time even following what you said, okay? And, and so if I have a hard time following what you said, so do our listeners. And so- So the accepted large, and no, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to understand what you, what you said. Okay? Well, look, then that's clear, right? That I, okay. that's more clear right there. That, that's that's not the purpose no. here. Okay, I'm not. I get it. That's you okay. already said it right there. You don't want to understand. I'll move on. I, I don't want to understand it because then we're debating something that happened before. Okay, and what I'm trying to do is present new ideas, new new ways of thinking that have not been adequately uh, discussed out, debated out, et cetera. So I don't wanna be, I don't wanna get stuck in the briar patch of the transpersonal movement, okay? I don't wanna- I think that we're saying the same thing, but I'm not gonna right. go into it further. Right, um, okay, that, that's good. I mean, if you wanna- Because if I don't wanna, see that how this is new, is okay. I think really where I'm going. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna desist. Okay, for you, it's not new, okay? But for 99.9% .9 of the people that might listen to this video, it might be new. <clears throat> and so if, if people want to um, see how idiotic these discussions can be in the ivory tower of a, a, academia, look up Jorge and Ferrer's 
Wikipedia page and you will see this sterile, okay, um, discussion among all these academics that never escapes the academy, okay? And what I'm trying to do is to get something beyond the academy, okay? So what mm -hmm. I'm doing- Boots is, on the ground. Yeah, right. you're getting boots on the ground. Right, and so the point is that this book is difficult to understand, okay? It's difficult to follow. And I'm trying to understand it as just, well, maybe I'm not an average <laughs> person in the sense that I've been studying Jung for 34 years and, I, and uh, I've been steeped in this for a very long time. But what I'm trying to do is to serve as an in intermediary between that kind of sterile debate about ideas between academic academics that never has escaped it's her hermetically sealed within the <laughs> academy i'm trying no to and i get that because you're playing it. air you're playing air traffic control tower and you're trying to get them to land that plane in a way for example when i said that no previous... i don't want them to land the plane I, i'm not interested in them landing the plane they can stay in the academy all they want okay what i'm what i'm trying to do is to get the rest of us to land the plane to pull a few ideas out. Well, that's what I mean, what, is that to land the plane in regards to, it's understandable from the street sweeper on the street. Otherwise I can just talk the weather with the street sweeper, but we can't get along. So that, I think that's important to land it, not, not, not them land it and get out of the plane, land it to where it's understandable and applicable and people can use it. Yeah, that's the point. All right, so yeah. let me, let, I'm gonna go back to, um, Tim's sculpture now, and this is the sculpture, and it's called Returning the Nails. And what it refers to is, and, and this is an enactment by Tim Holmes of how things should be, okay, or ought to be. And what this represents is uh, Mary, the mother of God, returning the nails that were used to crucify Jesus to the Roman authorities. Okay, now, historically, in the Bible, there's no evidence of this, okay? There's no, there's no such thing in the Bible. And this was simply uh, a conjecture by Tim Holmes, which he put in actually two sculptures. This is one of them. Uh, and so this is Mary, mother of Jesus Christ, after the crucifixion, returning the nails to the Roman authorities. Now, what, why? Okay, well, he was, a, he was investigating early metallurgy, and he realized that uh, in Jesus's time, um, iron which was used for the nails was a strategic el uh, element, a strategic metal, and therefore of great value. It would be like uh, doing something with gold today because it was so hard to make um, iron and therefore difficult to make nails. I mean, even <clears throat> in the US, we've had wooden nails uh, for a long time uh, too. And the early pioneers used woman wooden nails and they used sod to make houses and so on. So, so the idea is that Mary is returning the nails which relate to a physical value in the world because she did no longer needed them because Jesus Christ's life was not about the physical world. It was about the spiritual world. And the nails have no meaning in the context of Jesus Christ's life, okay? They, they simply represent a, uh, a part of the way that a hierarchical structure in the physical world operates okay and the way it operated was it cru crucified jesus christ because it didn't like his ideas right and 
uh, and that was performed by a physical thing, which was the nails. But Jesus Christ didn't need to didn't need the nails and she didn't need the nails and the nails had nothing to do with the fact that her son rose from the dead and is immortal okay and there can be no doubt that that's true about jesus christ because we're talking about him today and his his story is widely known and so his spirit is surely still with us just as many other people's spirit is still with us in many ways. I mean, if you look at the image in my uh, virtual background here, um, you know, Carl Jung is here with us too today. Uh, and this is his testament in stone, um, namely his home at Bollingen, which he built um, with his bare hands. But the the fact is, it's not the fact that he built a house in stone that's significant. It's the fact that he changed perceptions of so many people and continues to do so in a spiritual sense, which makes him immortal. In other words, he could die uh, completely satisfied because he knew that his spirit would live on uh, because of what he had done in his lifetime. And so if you want to talk about immortality and uh, passing your spirit down through the ages, then you better get busy in your physical lifetime because that's what it's about. Uh, your spirit will pass down in one form or another, either subtly or um, grossly it's grossly referred to here by the by the testament and stone that that Carl Jung left behind in the form of Bollingen but his but his significance he's not immortal because he built a house that had no electricity and no um, and no plumbing okay and didn't have running water it wasn't plumbed at all um, and so the fact that he built that structure and lived in it for many years uh, over his lifetime uh, isn't significant. What is significant is what he wrote and what uh, by meditating in that building, he was uh, able to bring into a form that the rest of us could understand. And that's what makes him uh, truly immortal and, uh, and so the point of the returning the nails image is not, it's not about physical truth. It's about Tim Holmes expressing the significance of the spiritual um, immortality of Jesus Christ. That's the point. And it has nothing to do with the physical world and therefore um, the Virgin Mary can return the physical nails to the authorities, which had value because, because she knew that her son was, had risen from the dead. Simple as that. So uh, can I, can I jump in? Yeah, Skip? sure. Yeah, go so ahead. Dave. One, um, I, you know, one, one of my topics was uh, the problem of the three and the four and which you know has been broached uh, at various uh, stages by, by Jung <clears throat> and the thing is uh, the cross Jesus on the cross is the three and the four everybody sees the four uh, the quaternity of the cross mm -hmm. but few people notice that there's a three which is a triangle but, you know the three nails the the uh, 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 Mary holds in her in her hand. They're three. Yeah. And, uh, and David, I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to have to excuse myself for a minute to oh. make a bio break. You can uh, continue to discuss this with Jordan if you want, and I'll be right back. I want to hear what you're saying, but I want to hear it when I'm not under stress. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So so. Uh, 
basically the notion that you know the 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 three should be shed. Uh, now it is the time of the cross, and, and we in the quaternity, meaning we in the sort of <clears throat> conscious life, and 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 the unconscious, the three, has just been let go of, and uh, this this happens uh, uh, um, uh, uh, through the Jesus' uh, uh, coming about. Uh, okay, there's a lot more I, I we, we could say, you know. The, this this same image of the of the of the three and the four you find, you know, for example, uh, in, in the I Ching, uh, uh, when you count uh, uh, on the conscious level, you 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 count you you, you count the, the the stalks, fours become threes. So you count four in your hands, but you write it down as three. And if you get an eight, which is the other possible combination, you get a two because it's two times four. And uh, so there are many things in, in um, I mean, I was, I, 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 I'm not going to dwell on this because uh, uh, I don't want to get out of, this, of, of today's topic, but I thought it was interesting seeing that, you know, she's holding these uh, three nails in her hand. Thanks. Well, and that's, that's a wonderful um, example, David. And I appreciate you bring it up too, because honestly, the three and the four are both there with her. There are the three that are the nails. She be- makes the fourth. And like with any system, it's always N plus one. If there are five, the group is the sixth. If, if, and the same with the Ching, you're playing grouping reductions. And the, the, tr- the Trinity is the first structurally stable shape, the triangle. And then the Quaternity is the first established meets and bounds parcel, say of land or empire or plat. And it's also the squared circle. Because you start with the the unsquared circle, that's the the pure self of potential. One line across it, and it starts to become gestured. Two, and you have the crossing, which is the birth of consciousness, as you're saying now, four. And I, I, I think it's interesting that you say the shedding of the three, because that's a that's a strong and powerful concept in terms of literally just sequencing forward counting. And then it applies directly psychologically. Okay, uh, so, um, all right, David, would you make your point once more? And then uh, I want to be very clear, though. Um, this discussion today is not for the purpose of discussing um, esoteric alchemical issues. This is specifically for discussion of Jose Ferrer's book, okay? And so, um, I'm going to go, go ahead and ask you to make your point once more, and then we're going to move on to it's, the, it's, to the I, issues I, mean, I have to talk I, about. Okay, because this is, ex, ex, excuse Sorry. me, this is not a, a free reign discussion and isn't intended as that. It, this is intended for me to get some ideas across, and, and therefore I have an agenda that I need to follow. So go ahead and make your point again, and then skip. It's recorded. It's it's okay. It's it's on it's on the video. I mean, you can watch it later. We we had a, a quick exchange, Jordan and I, on the topic okay. of the three and the four. But let's move okay. on. Let's move on. Okay, I want to go back then um, because there's um, uh, there's a. A section here that of this book that I want to read, and I'm going to go back to page 37. Now I'm jumping around a little bit because I simply want the audience to to be uh, exposed to these ideas in a general way, in the spirit of um, tell people what you're going to tell them tell them, then tell people what you told them, (laughs) okay? And so I've been looking at this book, trying to understand it for four months. I'm not sure I understand it entirely yet, but I'm hopeful that among the 22 people that are currently watching on YouTube and the the current panel, uh, we can start people thinking about some of these ideas. So one important idea here that we've just finished is the idea that instead of discovering the truth, okay, that 
we are going to enact the truth as it ought to be or as it can be okay and so now i'm so that was at the end of the book that's part of of dr ferrer's uh, summation but i'm going to go back to page 37 now the basic issue is that as it has often been stressed in the religious literature the goal of the spiritual quest is not to have spiritual experiences but to stabilize spiritual consciousness live a spiritual life and transform the world accordingly and it cannot be repeated too often that regardless of the quantity of spiritual experiences um, spiritual experiences do not produce a spiritual life a cru crucial task for transpersonal studies then is to develop both conceptual frameworks and practical injunctions that support the translation of transient spiritual states into the stable transformation of self, relationships, and world. Okay, I'm gonna stop at that point. That's just a paragraph in the middle of this book, but I wanna go back now to, um, to a couple of issues that, uh, Dr. Ferrer is raising here because he, he first is um, deconstructing the transpersonal ideas. And so he has one chapter on this called the empiricist colonization of spirituality. And his point simply is that uh, the transpersonal community, the community that's um, been studying these things for the last um, 60 years, um, try to make their ideas fit the scientific method. And in fact, that's what that, that he was saying. And so um, here's a, a, just a little blurb at the beginning of this chapter. Spiritual knowledge is not the fruit of psychological imagination or pathological delusion. Anyone who has seriously engaged in a spiritual life knows that essential information about human nature and reality can be revealed through spiritual states. The wholesome impulse to legitimize spiritual knowledge is uh, knowledge in our modern times, however, has often taken the form of defending its scientific and empirical status. Parallels between the spiritual path and the scientific method are established and the birth of a new science of spiritual experience is triumphantly announced. In this chapter, I suggest that the similarities between spirituality and science are more apparent than real and therefore that the efforts to legitimize spiritual knowledge by appealing to its scientific status may be both misleading and counterproductive. And so the point being here, uh, and this is a whole chapter on this topic, but the point being that um, the significance of spiritual events which have been the source of religion um, is not necessarily provable by the scientific method. But many of these guys over the last 60 years have gone off on this tangent of trying to prove it according to the scientific method. Because once you've actually had a real spiritual experience, such as the one that I showed at the beginning of this session, then it doesn't matter what science says. Once you have that experience, then you know. You don't have to believe, you know. And this is what Dr. Jung was talking about. Okay, now the next chapter, I'll just bring uh, that piece in too. At the beginning of the next chapter, um, there's this comment, okay, and this is called Trouble in Paradise, the perennial philosophy revisited. Now, this is the idea that 
all religions are basically the same. And if you deconstruct them and put them side by side, you can say, okay, they all do the same thing. All right, so the perennial philosophy revisited. We live in a world of rich spiritual diversity and innovation. Spiritual tradition of, traditions offer disparate and often conflicting visions of reality and human nature. To the modern mind, this is profoundly perplexing. How to account for these important differences when most of these traditions are supposedly depicting universal and ultimate truths. In the wake of this predicament, it is both tempting and comforting to embrace universalist visions that in their claim to honor all truths seem to bring order to such apparent religious chaos, seem to bring order to such apparent religious chaos. In this chapter, I argue that despite their professed inclusivist stance, most universalist visions distort the essential message of the various religious traditions, covertly favor certain spiritual paths over others, and raise serious obstacles for spiritual dialogue and inquiry. Okay, so this is just an assertion of his. But the point being that um, if you embrace this idea, what tends to happen is that you tend to favor one spiritual path over another. So in other words, in the ecumenical monthly lunch between the local mullah, rabbi, priest, and pastor, um, they appear to be ecumenical and everything is, is universalist vision. But the problem is that then they all go back and continue to do what they've been doing for the last 2000 years. And, and so uh, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. I think that's basically what he's saying. I mean, do, do you see, do I make sense, Jordan? Do I make sense, David, in that respect? I'd say yes, definitely. Um, and it's basically playing the, we're gonna take our token lunch to appear that we're gonna enact change and then we're gonna get wrapped back up in our momentum and flow right back into the status quo of, again, inspect your expectations and they do not. So they just fall right back into it. So I would say short answer, complete sentence, yes. Okay, David, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I, it's, uh, I mean, what you said and the way you, you, know, you presented it is, is obviously, it's very interesting and, and, and very clear. Uh, my, my understanding of you know, why different religions and why different streams in similar religions, such as you know, in Islam, and to me, it has a lot to do with you know, uh, our psychological uh, uh, stance. And it's, you know, I mean, I don't know to what extent, but I, I, I think you uh, wrote about, you know, the, the, the um, Protestants being more introverts, you know, bringing the faith back to themselves, uh, whereas Catholics might be more extroverted. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, what I see, it's, it's, it has more to do with how, as an individual or even as a group, we envision life. For example, going back to the Portuguese very quickly, Portuguese are an extremely uh, 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 introverted people, very, very strongly introverted people. I mean, for anyone who's lived and worked <clears throat> in, in Portugal, such as myself, you know, it's very clear. And the notion, the idea that, you know, some people from elsewhere would come in, them being introverted, introverts, it would mean they would be absorbed and with no, uh, 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 no, no way of countering it. So there again, you know, I, 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 I think that, that a, a lot of this has to do with one's uh, psychological stance and, and, and it's difficult. And, you know, you, you can have all the lunches you, you, you want and, and, be, and agree on all points. That's not going to change at the end of the lunch. Right. OK. And so uh, I think your point about psychological stance is right on. OK. And it's 
one of the places that I had trouble understanding Dr. Young for many years because um, he uh, wrote this book called Ion and uh, Jordan Peterson called it I don't know, the most dangerous work he ever read or something like that. <laughs> what I can say is that when I got to chapter five, um, and that chapter is entitled Christ as a symbol of the self, um, my reaction to that based on my upbringing uh, in Christianity to the extent it existed um, was, are you talking about the son of God? You know, how, how is the son of God a symbol of the self? And uh, that idea, um, I really clashed with that. And it came from, um, uh, you know, I had seen this uh, film clip of Dr. Jung from um, about 12, uh, 2005. I saw the film clip of him saying, um, I have no need to believe I know. And my immediate reaction to that was, I too know. Okay. So then, but what did I know? Then I had to ask myself, what do I know? And, um, you know, I'd written a book uh, about the same t time uh, called Tsunami of Blood. Uh, and it's a book um, about the fact that we were setting ourselves for what actually has happened in the Middle East in the last 15 years. It was actually prescient <laughs> in that way. And in that book, um, I made many references to God and my wife, um, who's been with me for 35 years, uh, and this is now 15 years ago, said, well, I don't, I didn't know that you had uh, such a strong feeling about God uh, because we never go to church and we have, um, uh, we have followed Tibetan Buddhism a bit since 1994, but she became uh, a Tibetan Buddhist Lama. And in fact, I mean, she didn't, she never took ordination, but she took a three year, uh, retreat as a Buddhist, which amounts to divinity school in Tibetan Buddhism. And she is one of the leading teachers of Buddhism in the Washington area, area other than actual ordained lamas. And, um, but I, uh, at the same time, I had difficulty ex accepting some aspects of Buddhism, for example, the prostrations to a teacher. And, um, and so I have followed it very loosely. Um, while she has followed it quite strongly. And, um, and so when I ran into Dr. Young's statement, I said, Okay, wow, um, I, I don't have a need to believe I know too, but what do I know? And so that developed into a 10 year study where um, among other things, I came to terms with this chapter five in ION researches into the phenomenology of the self. I mean, when I started to read that book, um, I had no idea what he was talking about. What, what's this? after the colon stuff that he's saying, researches into the phenomenology of the self. What the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> and, and why is Christ a symbol of the self? And so it took me a very, very long time to even understand that. Um, and, and so, um, as you say, David, we come to these things with with pre, you know, we're we have it pre baked into us. I mean, we're you know we're a Muslim or we're a Christian or we're a Jew or we're a, a Buddhist or we're a Hindu, and and these things are pre baked in because they're baked into our societies, and um, 
to be able to think for yourself and start to enact uh, what should be and what can be, as opposed to always relying on somebody else to tell you what the truth is. Um, there's, a, there's a big difference there, a big difference. And, um, and so that's what this is about in this conversation is also about. Okay, so further comments, Jordan, before I move into something else? Yeah, I, I find it a chief interest, especially the background, because for example, it, you hit that and it was, wow, like a brick wall. I hit Ion and it became my instant favorite book. Just the title, Christ is a Symbol of Self, the Ichthyos, glowing-eyed fish yanked from the deep. But I go to my background, seven years old, I'm reading Zen Flesh, Zen Bones to my mom in the car because I'm probably the first audio book and she didn't have time to read with all the errands and teaching and doing advertising. And so I read her her books. So Zen Flesh, Zen Bones at seven, at eight, my stepmother turns me on to Alan Watts, the magical, musical, mystical bear, the book. Um, William Blake comes right after, Rilke, Reiner Maria Rilke. Um, Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Nietzsche. And I'm surprised I didn't find Jung until I was 20, 21. Um, but that was probably because of the psychological aspect. So when I come up on it and I have all these pieces that are just primed me and I go, Ion, chapter five, wow, someone actually finally said it. That's how I am. I know. And then what I find chiefly interesting is then you and I and David here, we're all here. And being on multiple of your panels, we're, we're tracking the same or similar paths now, regardless of our backgrounds. And I find that to be of chief interest because then where you're coming from can color and influence what I'm doing. And hopefully every once in a while, I'll provide a tidbit here and there that's actually useful. But the background, notwithstanding, if I cancel that out, we're in a similar location now. And that's, I just find that evolution interesting. Okay. Um, all right. There's a comment here on, um, on the YouTube chat. Um, which I only, um, pimp, pimp Jack, pimp jerk, <laughs> somebody who identifies himself as pimp, pimp jerk, uh, you might want to rethink your handle, sir. But uh, in any case, <laughs> he makes this comment that Aldous Huxley wrote the perennial philosophy he died of cancer the same day as JFK was assassinated. Huxley took LSD on his deathbed to his, assist his consciousness in transition. Um, well, um, I, I'm sorry, I, we, we can't uh, promote <laughs> taking LSD for anything on this channel. And I don't promote that. Um, I would appreciate it if those of you who are making comments on uh, YouTube or anywhere, uh, please do not write things that suggest that taking LSD is a useful uh, thing because um, consciousness and transition, I mean, um, my Turkish playwright novelist friend made a comment once to me, uh, which I find very apt in this situation. And that is, um, when you're dead, you don't know you're dead. It's only difficult for your family. When you're stupid, it works the same way. And so the point is that if, uh, if that's the way Aldous Huxley was thinking, uh, his thinking wasn't quite as enlightened as he might want you to believe. Uh, and uh, because that thinking suggests that he thinks his physical consciousness in his body that died on November the 22nd, 1963, um, was going to go on, which it didn't. Okay. And 
his spirit went on. And we're talking about him today because his spirit went on, but the LSD didn't have, have anything to do with that. I mean, it might've helped him die more comfortably, I suppose, in, in some strange worldview, but, um, you know, look at the creatures that you've ever seen that were dead. Okay. Did they, <laughs> you think that their consciousness went on? Uh, you're one of those. Okay. We're all, we're all mammals. And so if you want your spirit to be immortal, then you need to do it in this lifetime. And, um, and LSD is not going to help that. It's going to deter that, I think. Um, all right. Uh, That's an interesting point, actually. It came to me, too, of to the legacy piece of our works. Um, and then, you know, it's indicating to make your life immortal, you create a lot of dead things to leave behind for other people to be enlivened by or well, to and, spark and, something. And we leave behind us you know, entire flocks of chickens and entire herds of, of cattle and so on. If we're beef eaters or, or bird eaters or fish eaters, or, you know, entire schools of fish we've eaten, all of us, each one of us has done. And, and uh, so if, if their spirit lives on, it lives on through human consciousness and that human consciousness is, is conveyed down through the centuries as a part of spirit. Um, and, um, and the spirit is taking us someplace, okay? It's taking us individually someplace so that uh, Aldous Huxley had his, his impact on the human species and Carl Jung had his Im impact and we're having our impact today. Um, but, uh, you know, after our physical body is gone, we may still be having our impact because of things we've done in our lifetime, uh, but not after death. And so one of the issues that has always been a part of this is uh, Ernest Becker's denial of death and how human beings are always trying to avoid death. Well, death isn't anything that you have to be worried about because, oh, by the way, you're not going to know you're dead and, you know, nothing's going to be happening then. <clears throat> okay. And you know, it's and, funny, Skip, as Mark Twain said, you know, I, I was dead for billions and billions of years <clears throat> before I came here and it didn't infect me in the least. So, Yeah. And so, you know, people pass their the content of their spirit along in many ways they carry it on through their children and um you know either positively or negatively but nonetheless uh if they do nothing else but have children uh then those children are going to carry on uh, the spirits spirit of their parents <clears throat> and um and so i've uh, carried on my mother's spirit right here in this discussion where I said that, uh, you know, she was a great storyteller and she said, well, if it's not true, it ought to be. And, and that's the point, isn't it? That it ought to, if it ought to be, then it should be repeated. And so all of you and everybody that ever hears this in the future uh, can have that part of my mother's spirit because now I've just conveyed it to you. Okay. So there's two caveats that I want to uh, wrap this up with today. And uh, these are warnings from Dr. Ferrer. And, um, and in future weeks, I'm going to take up something about his conclusions. I have invited Dr. Ferrer to speak with our wisdom path colloquia at some point in the future, early in 2021. I've not heard back from him yet. And uh, I will uh, hopefully get him to do that um, sometime soon because I'm sure I'm conveying what he said in his book very imperfectly. Um, but, uh, but the, um, 
but the idea is the the I want to get some of these ideas out out there in the world and let you do your own research on them and uh, your own consideration of them. And so there's two caveats that I want to bring up, which we've discussed in the advanced reading group about three or four weeks ago. But one of them is spiritual narcissism. And um, that has to do with um, something like I say, oh, well, I have religious experiences every day. Well, that isn't meant to aggrandize me. That is meant to say that these things are quite common. They happen all the time. And uh, the question is, are you uh, attuned enough to what we're talking about so that you experience them too? And um, it doesn't make me special because I had this experience in the chapel, which I took pictures of, which is at the beginning of this uh, conversation. Um, that doesn't make me special at all. It means that I had learned enough over the years to know that this was a very special experience in that instant. Okay, so it, ha it started to happen and within five seconds, my whole attitude about my life had changed in that five seconds. And uh, I had the, the wherewithal to say, well, nobody's going to believe this unless I take a picture of it. So I pulled the camera up. And so 10, 10 seconds after the experience happened, I was photographing it. And then within two or three seconds after that, I was taking a selfie of it and therefore I captured it. Okay, those are very difficult things to capture, but they don't make me special. They only say, you know, this is the type of thing we're talking about or, you know, they don't have to be this grandiose. I mean, but obviously um, someone like um, uh, Jeanne d'Arc, Joan of Arc, um, is an example where she had a spiritual experience and that caused her to transmit energy through the French army, which allowed her at the age of 14 uh, to lead the French army into battle. Now, if she hadn't had that experience, she probably could not have done that as most 14 year old girls uh, cannot do, but she had it, she believed it, she trusted it, and she was able to um, catalyze that uh, experience into an energy that passed through an entire army. And so um, it isn't to say that these experiences aren't uh, special, they are, um, but they're special to you. They're not special to anybody else necessarily. Um, and um, in no way am I suggesting that I'm anything special from you uh, because I've had those experiences. I'm simply saying uh, pay attention and you'll have them too. And then we will start to see as a collective, uh, we'll start to raise ourselves to the fifth stage of consciousness and start to see what we have to do uh, to make a better world for all of us, for all human beings. And uh, so, but, you know, there is this problem that you, if you have this experience and think that makes you special, then, then uh, please think again. Okay, the other... Skip, I think it's important and also for the audience to note um, your example about spiritual experiences you've had. I've had similar, but that we both had them prior to Jung. And then we read Jung and go, oh, it's it's OK. It's qualitatively something that I'm not the only one who experienced it. So then even you sharing that someone may find this video before they find Jung and go, oh, I've had that. And it, it gives them the ability to keep that open so that they can listen, not just hear, but listen to experience those things. Because by your example, I mean, Jung was an example to you as well, me, 
But now also here by your example with your photograph even, people might viscerally get it and go, oh, Skip had, uh, oh, okay, I, uh, that's important. And they, they'll get tingles, whatever they get, but that gives them credence to continue that inner journey in a way that gives it value instead of, oh, well, that was just me. I mean, the old adage of no one can be a prophet in their own hometown. So it's hard to be a prophet, you know, within yourself. Um, and, and that way they'll give credence to the value of their inner contents, just maybe yeah. even by your example. Right. Okay. So the other point, um, uh, besides uh, uh, spiritual narcissism, is the problem of integrative arrestment. And that means something like, oh, for me, that experience was something special, and I don't move from that, okay, um, right. which, which might have been the case of um, Jeanne d'Arc, because she didn't have the chance to live further to, um, to integrate it. But uh, the idea is uh, this, I'll, I'll just uh, read a little bit more here uh, of this book so that we understand this. Okay, so here's what he says. In this regard, I believe that the experiential vision rather than fostering this integration, raises several obstacles that crystallize in, in what I call integrative arrestment. By integrative arrestment, I mean the hindrance of the natural integration process that translates spiritual realizations into everyday life towards the transformation of self, relationships, and world. Uh, there are at least two um, features of the experiential vision that contribute to this sequestration of the natural integrative power of spiritual phenomena. The first is the emphasis placed on individual inner experiences, uh, which comes usually accompanied by a disregard toward other elements of traditional spiritual paths, such as ethical commitments community life, relationships with teachers, and serious study of scriptures, and so forth. Okay, so in other words, you have this spiritual experience, oh, well, that's great, but does that make you a moral person? Uh, you know, that'd be one example. However, many of these non-experiential elements are traditionally regarded as essential to the integration of spiritual insights and the effective navigation of the spiritual journey. A, corrective, a correct understanding of spiritual doctrines, for example, is considered in most spiritual traditions a prerequisite for the practice of meditation and the transconceptual access to the ultimate. Now, I just want to say that, you know, that's the issue, which is uh, that every spiritual tradition uh, you know, expects you to toe the party line and to believe the set the way they say they you should believe. And what I say is you should believe the way you say you should believe. And um, because if you have one of these experiences, then you will know. And so that's all well and good. Uh, but then you need to pay attention to these uh, other issues, the ethical commitments, the community life relationships with teachers and serious study of the scriptures. You, you know, I can seriously study the Bhagavad Gita, for example, which I did over the summer. Uh, and I studied in, in a very serious way because uh, Kushbu Kantaria and I read the whole Bhagavad Gita, not only in Sanskrit, but in three English translations. So as of May the 9th, I had not read the Bhagavad Gita, but now I've read it three times on video. <laughs> and that I can promise you that that was a very serious study of the Bhagavad Gita. And now I have grokked it and grokked its importance uh, in the development of the human species. And uh, if you haven't 
done that, maybe it's time that you do it too. And I've made it easy for you uh, because uh, Kushbu and I read the whole thing on this YouTube channel. And so you can listen to it in your spare time and you don't have to grunt through any of the translations or worry about the fact that, oh, by the way, there's over 1,100 translations of the Bhagavad Gita and none of them are the same. So, um, well, wasn't, wasn't it Young that said if, if it was a, available for you to get there by reading these scriptures, to reading the works, the world would have all each enlightened over and over every year for the last thousands of years. I mean, so it was a matter of you have to do it rather than read it and have to enact it, experience it, literally. Yeah. Um, okay, so Miles says, I wonder if the practice of going on vision quest uh, that indigenous people do is to be comfortable when death is really going to happen one day. And Manuela says, hi, Miles, there is an overgeneralization about indigenous people and is about, is almost naive, not want to be rude, to think that a group of people is all the same and uh very good point and um you know i would say miles is, may be in indicating that the vision quest if i redo remove the indigenous people part of it that say the walkabout that the vision quest is there may be something where they are rehearsing death they are looking into the beyond yeah so Manuela goes on the same if uh, you think about each group of people catholics Buddhists, uh, we are different, especially facing death. Um, and, uh, and so Miles says, I know that there is a, is a tremendous variety with the generalizations of indigenous people. Vision Quest is a feature of many First Nations people in Canada. Okay, so... Um, what, what I would say is that, um, you know, religions, regardless of whose religion they are, have been used for maintaining mental health since the beginning. This is what Dr. Jung had observed in Civilizations in Transition, that they are all systems of mental health. And, um, we all have to find our own um, way of looking at it. And as Ernest Becker said, we're, we all try to de deny death or the fact that we will die um, in one way or another. Um, you know, some people <laughs> do it by, um, by thinking that they're going to be an angel in heaven, but where is heaven and where is hell? Well, I can tell you where hell is. It's right here on the, on the earth and so is heaven. And, um, you know, for example, I literally had this vision of Mephistopheles plumping down my, in the seat next to me when my daughter said, told me that I was going to hell and, um, when she said that to me, I dropped into hell right at that moment. And it took me uh, 10 years to find my way out of it. And so what is that hell? That hell is, um, is the idea that any of my daughters who I love very much would ever think that of me. I mean, I have, um, I, you know, no, I don't think any father wants their daughter to think such a thing. And uh, so I made the Faustian bargain with Mephistopheles, which was that he could have my eternal soul on my death, provided none of my daughters think of think that of me for the rest of my life. And um, here I am uh, 21 or 22 years later, and uh, while I have a very, very strong relationship with my daughter and all of my daughters, um, you know, still that 
that incident is, you know, kind of a cloud on my life. And uh, I've learned how to deal with it, I think, and cope with it. Uh, but, you know, who, who teaches a child to say such a thing to a parent? You know, aren't they, um, aren't they actually emissaries from the devil himself? Um, because, um, you know, the, it's just a horrible thing to do. And I know that they, I know that religions have forced people to follow religions uh, by the fear factor for thousands of years. And uh, you know, f fear, divine punishment, etc. Uh, but you know, the, we have enough to deal with in our physical life without having to fear eternal damnation. <laughs> and, you know, and maybe I will be eternally damned. I don't know, but I suppose the answer. Well, there's. I suppose the answer is that if. Um, if I am internally damned, it means I did accomplish something also. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, the, the old quote of um, the devil will use, will quote the scripture as is convenient, but then you have the cartoon to counterpoint it where the devil's sitting there in bed reading at night. He's reading the Bible. He's like, wait, I didn't do that. Uh, right. So the, so the distortions, you know, that are so, how they're utilized. Okay. So the summation, I think, of what we're trying to say is that um, we have to enact the world that we want, okay, and the, the world that should be and that we want to be. Uh, and if we're taking anybody else's guidance for what the world should be, then you're living somebody else's life. And so mm -hmm. what I urge everyone to do is to evaluate what I've said here and what you say in your own life and what is the life that you want to have? What is the world that you want to have? What are the people like that you want to interact with? And, um, you know, it's quite possible that then you will find that, oh, by the way, all traditions have a lot of good ideas. And you can draw from all those traditions. Um, but in the end, uh, the question is, are you going to live your life or somebody else's life? And uh, if you're going to live your life, then you have to make your own decisions about um, the world that you are going to enact. And if you do ugly things, bad things, then um, the world will probably enact back at you in very ugly, bad ways. Yeah. Consequences. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's always consequences. So, uh, okay, so I guess we've gone for two and a half hours here and it's time to sign off for today there's there's a lot and thanks more. for the discourse today chris I mean, i'm sorry skip um it i appreciate uh, your tolerance too of i know i'm kind of always trying to come in in a place where it's better to talk to the street sweepers so that means you understand it more like einstein would say can you describe that to a four-year-old and yeah. i don't want to insinuate that anyone out there is a four-year-old but if if i can bring what i have to offer at a level that is understandable by more or all, um, then I'd be a legitimate force here. And I think I'm always kind of working on that. So um, thanks for tolerance out there on YouTube and yours as well. Um, for things that are ultimately familiar with me, I have to get kind of past my what I find simple and actually back up to what inspired me about it and what's the core concept. So thank you. Yeah. And uh, Pimp Jerk does say something valuable here, which is uh, there is no damnation. There is no hellish afterlife. Love is the answer. And Miles responds, uh, I love Todd Rundgren's song, Love is the Answer. Um, well, uh, 
you know, lo love is the answer uh, that we need to be following because if we if we follow hate of our fellow man, we're going to get hate back, and um, and that's been demonstrated ad infinitum throughout the human experience. Uh, and but you know the just look around you. Here's what I would say: look around you at every thing that you have in your room at the moment. Uh, and think about this, every single thing that you have in your room, uh, you thought was good at some point in time. If you don't think it's good, you should be throwing it out, of course. Why keep it in your room <laughs> if it's not good, right? And, and so the things that survive in the human species and in human civilization are, uh, the things that do categorize themselves as good, because if they're if they're not good, they get destroyed one way or another, and and so I would just observe that and observe that um, not good um, means also not here, and so if you want to. If you want your spirit to have uh, an ongoing life, then you have to um, do things in this life that make that happen. Um, I guess that's my final thought on this. Uh, so I will be continuing. I've, today I've been reading from uh, Revisioning Transpersonal Theory, uh, The Participatory Vision of Human Spirituality. Um, by Jorge and Ferrer, and I would, um, you know, urge you to start looking into these things. Um, this is a very complex area. These people who have been working on this for the last 60 years have transgressed a lot of traditional lines in order to do that. And so <clears throat> it's, um, it's sometimes a challenge to accept it and understand it because we have been told certain things when we we're brought up by our parents, by our pastors and priests and rabbis, uh, by uh, whoever teaches us. And so we get certain ideas fixed in our mind and then our ideas get challenged. And, um, and so it's a, it's, it's a difficult task to move into this new stage of consciousness that we are trying to achieve. And, um, but I think it's worth the effort. I um, have intimations that I'm moving up in that way. I'm, I'm not saying I'm there yet, but at least I'm comprehending the literature now. <laughs> so that's a start. And uh, that's what I've been presenting to you. And so um, I'd like you to think about that, about thinking about living your own life, not someone else's life. And what is going to make that life good, your life good for you. Uh, and if you do that, then I think you'll see huge benefits uh, from it for your lifetime. Uh, so thank you. Uh, tomorrow, um, we will be talking about um, uh, the Tarot and the topic for tomorrow is, unbelievably enough, the devil. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that will be an ever popular topic, and we go begin, figure, you know. <laughs> yeah, and we begin that conversation on YouTube at um, eight p.m. Eastern time, Eastern U.S. time. Um, but if you join the panel, then you can come on at seven p.m. on Zoom and you will hear our discussion of what it is we think we're doing in the world with the Tarot. And that's an open discussion led by 
uh, Nick Lawrence is one of our colleagues. And um, so I urge you to take a look at that. It's uh, Taroa's Roadmap for Life. And uh, what we mean by that has already been expressed in the series. And so there is a playlist by that name uh, on the YouTube channel. And I urge you to take a look at that. And so I guess that's all I have to say. So peace, have a, have a great rest of your weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining me today, Jordan. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, bye.